I started at the Royal Institute of Technology. I've been a field application engineer at National Semiconductor, working with the Series 32000 and now Demise Processor. Then I worked at Atmel, and that's where I got in contact with uh, the Open Embedded team. I started asking questions on the mailing list, and while they didn't phrase it, the best basic told me to fuck off and send us some boards, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> So I sent them 10 ARM9 boards and 10 AVR32 boards, and after like a month, there was full open embedded support on the stuff. My problem was I had a laptop, which would take 42 hours to build the open embedded stuff. But once I got the nice desktop that would build in just seven hours, I started to contribute to the project. Uh, right now, I'm working as a consultant in my own company. If you wonder about the name, the Imagine name, it comes from the Bible, the three Magi's visited Jesus in Bethlehem. And I say, they did a thing. Uh, they were ready before anyone else realized it was a project. Unfortunately, this gives the expansion possibilities for the companies to be rather limited. We can be maximum three persons. <laughs> okay, the requirements we had for our project. Uh, we wanted to have an easy factory programming on an empty board and we didn't want to use any custom tools and the project as I said contained a processor and multiple FPGAs. We wanted to be able to do an easy upgrade of the boards during development and we wanted to avoid bricked boards. I just worked on the project whenever you brick the board you have to remove the SOD module and put it somewhere else, and we know that the SODIM connector has maximum spec of 25 insertions. So it's not very nice, but this was not this project. We also want to have easy upgrade in the field, minimal board space. <clears throat> Configuration time is an issue for large FPGAs, but we didn't have that many uh, the large uh, FPGAs. We want to have a flexible boot source. So, the, we selected the Cyclone 10 LP, which are not very large FPGAs. And this has four different options to configure. Active serial, which means that the FPGA in itself reads from a dedicated SPI flash memory. Fast passive uh, parallel, which means that the process is writing to the FPGA on a parallel bus. We didn't want to use that because that uses a lot of pins. JTAG. We didn't like that because that means you need to have special tools. So the choice we have was passive serial, which means that the processor feeds in a serial bitstream to the FPGA during configuration. The problem is that the interface might sort of look like SPI, which is available in many processors, but it's, when you look at the application, it really doesn't look like SPI. So the idea was, if we try to use SPI, what happens? The difference you see here with SPI, you basically in SPI have a clock, you have data out, you have data in, and you have a chip select. But all the application nodes you find on these FPGAs tells you to have a data clock and a data zero. The ship has a ship select, but that's always grounded in the application nodes, which means that you have to use one SPI per FPGA. And that's not very nice because that uses a lot of pins on the processor. On top of that, you use some status pin. You have a config pin that starts configuration, then you read some status pins. Um, hopefully that can be shared. But you need one SPI per device. We didn't like that. Then we saw this way of configuring FPGA. You have two FPGAs, and this one is like the first one, but once you configure that, then you have a ship select out. So if you continue feed the bitstream, you start to program this FPGA. And that's when we realize that we shouldn't use the application node for this ship. We should use the application node for this ship and ignore, just remove that ship from the equation. Then it looks like this. And suddenly, we have an SPI. We have the data, we have the clock, and we have the ship enable. And I managed to get Intel to confirm that this actually works. This means that you can use a standard SPI driver to configure the FPGA. 
that simplifies the software quite a lot. So instead of having this kind of timing, you assert the config pin and then you have the ship enable low all the time. You have the bitstream that you feed in. Uh, once you get the config pin activated, you get the conf status pin, so config down goes low, the status goes high, and as long as it stays high, there's no error. And once it's ready configuring, then you get an init done. After the init done, it actually starts to do some internal processing, but this is guaranteed to complete in 650 microseconds, which means that we don't actually need to test that as long as we guarantee with the software timer that we don't do anything with the FPGA here. This gets with the SPI converted to this. So we basically just do a normal SPI transfer. That means that if we run in U-Boot, we don't have to develop any special driver to program the FPGA. We just call the existing SPI driver from this driver to do an SPI transfer. That simplifies things a lot. Uh, so the CPU interface now becomes this. You have clock, you have data out, and you have a ship select. People have been joking about write-only memories, and this actually looks like a write-only memory. <laughs> On top of that, you need these things, but this is handled. The, the, these pins doesn't need to be handled during the SBI transfer. So the target board we had had a Citara uh, microcontroller. It had two Cyclone ships. And then, to prepare for continuous integration, we had a USB port which has an SPI bridge for programming the boot ROM. It has a serial bridge with two UARCs uh, for console and application. And then we have GPIOs if we want to support uh, resetting the processor and booting in different boot modes. Of course, anyone with the right mind would use an Atmel processor which has an excellent boot ROM, which has a boot sequence, but if you use things which are not has a good boot ROM, then you might have to configure it using some external pins. And uh, then you can use these GPIOs to configure the boot modes, and then you apply a reset, and off you go. So this is the design. We have the hub, we have two USB ships, one of the USB ships to handle the continuous integration, we have another to basically allow us to read out stuff using a FIFO uh, from this one. And then we have a multiplexer here, so we can actually control this multiplexer and either we can program the SPI flash while the CPU is in reset, or we can let the CPU access the CP SPI flash, which is the normal mode. Whenever you boot, the CPU will have full access to the SPI flash, but this can intervene and block the CPU, program the flash, and then reset the CPU, yeah. which means that we would, are definitely protected against breaking the board. Whenever you have a problem, you just go to the USB and reprogram the SPI flash. And you can program this, of course, when it comes out of the factory, totally unprogrammed. You just connect the USB, run an application to program the SPI flash. FT4232 has four independent 8-bit ports. Two of them are a multi-protocol synchronous serial port, which are SPI, JTAG, or whatever, and two of them are plain UWARCH. And the FT2232 just have two independent half-duplex FIFO ports. So, <clears throat> this is uh, the critical part. I, I actually talked about this. Once we have the CPU running, it can read out the FPGA configuration files using standard uh, MTD commands, and then it will program each FPGA separately. Uh, if we have a chain of two FPGAs, like we had previously, uh, where one enabled the ship select of the other, we always have to reconfigure both FPGAs at the same time. Since these are basically both two peripherals on the SPI bus, you can reconfigure this totally uh, 
without regard this or vice versa, or you can serially program them uh, <coughs> during the boot. We decided that we program this one while we're waiting for the CPU. Uh, if you want, you have the boot delay, okay? And the boot delay, during the boot delay, you wait if the user wants to go into interactive mo mode. And we definitely have time to program both of the FPGAs during the boot delay. So you actually don't add any time to the boot process by programming the FPGAs this way. <coughs> there are some problems involved with this solution. And one of the problems is that this FD4232, it starts up as four PCU watch. And three of the pins are outputs. And they will toggle if you remove and reinsert the cable. And that's not very nice. We had another test board, and there we could actually power down the board. And once we got it out of the fab, we realized whenever you connected a PC cable, it would turn out the, off the power of the board. <laughs> Luckily, that was just a test board. But there are things like that which are a little bit of surprises which we end up to or better off prototyping stuff first. So the way to do it is to use the five inputs and to ensure they got the stable state by having external pull-up or pull-down resistors. And then you can, of course, change that on the fly by using commands. The other problem we found that some, FP, some circuits cannot handle that the USB circuit is active when it's powered down. The USB system is bus powered by the cable. So if this drives a pin to three volts, this might destroy the processor. We found that the processor couldn't tolerate this, the FPGAs could tolerate that, so we had to have some buffers in between. It's of course better to find a ship which can test whether the VCC IO is, is powered on or not. Uh, and only actually drive the pins when it's powered on. So, once we have this, the way to integrate this in the system is just that you add it to the SPI part of the device trees. So you have the SPI and you define the ship selects. And two of the ship selects goes to the FPGAs, two goes to other parts. And then you add just stuff here. And then it suddenly, like magic, ends up when you list things in U-Boot. So the device tree for an FPGA is basically you define the frequency, you define the name, you define the config size, and then the four status pins, you define which DPIO they're active on. And after that, you're free to use the FPGAs. The modifications in U-Boots are not that uh, much. Basically, MTD, ABI.h, you define a new class of MTD. I call it MTD FPGA. And the capabilities as if you can write to the FPGA, but you cannot erase it. That makes it the write only memory. You add a small K config conflict and add it to the make file, and then a simple driver will do. Simple driver will claim the SPI bus, it will pulse the config, wait for n status high, then it would just call the SPI driver, transfer the bitstream, release the SPI bus, and wait until config done or get an error. So the driver is extremely simple to do this uh, because it's using the SPI driver. And you don't need to worry about the actual SPI uh, thing because you already have the SPI driver in U-Boot, hopefully. A few other things is that it's hardwired to do raw and no, uh, <coughs> no uh, error correction block when it's an FPGA. And once you've done that, just do an MTD read from your SPI flash and an MTD write to the FPGA, because now it's the device in U-Boot. That's all there is to it to configure the FPGA. The status is that, well, I never got to patch the stuff upstream. The project first went on hold, and then they killed the project. So uh, we never got to that state. Uh, I had an original port using U-Boot 2020.10, which worked on actual hardware. And 
for this meeting, I tried to port it to 2023.01, uh, but I haven't been able to test it on a target because I don't have access to a target. But basically, it should not be a big problem getting it working. I didn't get to implement the Linux drive. I looked at it and it should be basically as simple as doing the U-boot driver. And once you have the uh, Linux driver to configure the FPGA, you don't need any special tools. You just copy your bitstream to the device and that's all there is to it. That's all.